Father God, we are so grateful to gather together in your name. And God, we ask that you would be in our midst, that you would speak to each and every one of us here through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Typically on a holiday weekend, our attendance is way down because this church is a traveling church. Do you know that? Everybody loves to go on vacation. <laughs> But I'm glad you made it. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Today we're going to cover verses 20 through 27. And in our text today, Jesus is going to let the disciples know really what his mission is on earth. What do you think the disciples thought Messiah was going to do? Yeah, take over Rome and establish uh, Israel as their, really his millennial kingdom, what we call the millennial kingdom. They thought Messiah, the first coming, was going to establish his kingdom on earth. And it's amazing that uh, they thought that. But Jesus tells them something radical in Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 20. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. Uh, the Hebrew word, Mashiach, which means what? The anointed one. Yeah, the anointed one of God, the one Messiah. Verse 21, but he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anybody. But Jesus would shock them with this. The next verse, verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up the third day. All right, throughout his ministry, this is the first time he gives the disciples a clue that, guess what? I didn't come to establish a kingdom. I came to be crucified, to die, and to raise again the third day. That must have shocked him, but Matthew gives us more detail of the event. Our good friend Peter has something to say to Jesus, and I laugh every time I read this. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? Okay, Peter has seen Jesus do miracles, raise people from the dead. He knew he was the anointed one of God, and he takes him aside and said, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> he's rebuking Jesus. God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Interesting. Don't, don't say that to your wives, guys, by the way. Yeah, it just doesn't work out very good. Pick up our cross, Luke 9, 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, you and I today wear crosses around our neck. We have crosses in front in our churches. We have crosses on our, our walls at home, and they're beautiful, made of gold, silver, with diamonds sometimes, and all these beautiful crosses. But we must remind ourselves what the cross is. The statement would have shocked the disciples. I mean, completely shocked them. Taking up one's cross was a reference to the Roman practice of having condemned criminals carry their own crosses to the place of execution. So when Jesus said, you must take up your cross and follow me, the immediate picture is the most despicable criminals carrying their crosses to be executed. It was a form of torture. The disciples, Je Jesus was saying, you're going to die the worst torture death. You're going to take up your cross and you're going to be killed or crucified. The Greek definition is a stake with a cross beam that only the most severe criminals were nailed to publicly until they died. 
an instrument of the most dreadful, agonizing torture in existence at that time. The cross was an instrument of torture. And when Jesus made this radical statement, hey, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up this torture instrument and carry it to your place of execution. Wow. That is radical. The disciples had to wonder what in the world is he talking about. The closest thing today would be a noose and a gallows. Could you imagine having a little gallow here with a noose hanging off it? You know, and, and wearing it around your neck. That's exactly what the cross meant to them, but worse. It was the most despicable, despised way to die. Take up your noose and follow me. Or take up your guillotine and follow me. Or electric chair and follow me. Wow. Folks, that's crazy. This was radical back then. When Jesus said this, he was conveying a profound and challenging message about discipleship and the cost of following him. We deny ourselves, we die to our old self and live life new as Christ followers. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, things have become new. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know, when we give our life to Jesus Christ, we crucify our old flesh. In fact, water baptism is, is symbolic of the act of being buried with Christ. So you go under the water and you come up a new creation. It's symbolic of that inner work that's, uh, by the way, we're going to be doing a baptism coming up. <laughs> so we'll let you guys know where and when. Uh, we used to do extreme baptisms at uh, Salt Creek, you know, the, the shore break beach. Uh, and so we let kind of the, 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 the wave do the baptizing. Okay, get ready. Here it comes. We, the, the ocean baptizes you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the whole <laughs> It's crazy. Back to our text. Verse 24 of Luke 9. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. You know, what Jesus is telling the disciples here is a radical message. It's a difficult message. He said, man, I'm going to die. Oh, I'll raise the third day. They, did, they, they never believed that when he said it. And then he said, if you want to save your life, you will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. To save your life is to try to save the old you. Are you with me? That's the life that we crucify. We die to our flesh. The old Brett, let's see, I was born again when I was six. <laughs> the old Brett stole cookies out of the cookie jar. And I don't want to go back to that old Brett, you know. <laughs> That's so funny. The you that is carnal and fleshly and steals cookies out of the cookie jar and worldly, that's the, the you that is dead. You don't try to save that. Are you with me? But the new you, you're a new creation in Christ. When we lose that version of us, we gain new life in Jesus, and we are born again. Not of flesh, not of uh, uh, that, but of the spirit. Amen? And we become spiritual beings and strangers and aliens on this planet. Back to our text, Luke 9, 25. For what? Is it a, for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself or his own soul? You see, it's all about where our treasure is. 
what Jesus is telling the disciples is radical stuff. Messiah is going to die. He'll raise up the third day. But you guys are going to have to die to who you were and be born again into a new place. Material gain or spiritual treasure. Luke 12, 30 says, For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you have need of them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I love that. Man, why do we seek after all this stuff? in life when we are going to actually be heirs, joint heirs with Jesus to the kingdom of God. We are going to rule and reign with Christ. God owns everything. As we've said, a cattle on a thousand hills. Well, guess what? You're an heir to that. You are a royal priestess and a royal priest. We are going to get the kingdom. The things of this world mean nothing. And he goes on to say, Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Back to our text. And that was uh, Luke uh, 12, 30 through 34. All right. Luke 9, 26, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. It's interesting, as he was saying this stuff, Matthew tells us Peter did what to Jesus as he's making this discourse? Took him aside and rebuked him, right? Said, that, <laughs> that's not going to happen, Lord. No, that's not going to happen. Peter had to be thinking in his head, are we convicts? Are we going to take up crosses to be your disciple? And you're going to be rejected by the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and even the Sanhedrin? I thought we were going to take over the temple, not be rejected by them and killed. So Peter had to be thinking, so he's saying, man, if you're ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. We, like Paul, must say this, Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek And we must verbalize Jesus as Lord, not just uh, feel it in our heart. Romans 10, 8 says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And note this, with the mouth, One confesses and is saved. And so it's professing that Jesus is Lord of your life. So back to our text, Luke 9, 27. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Have you ever wondered about that verse? What in the world is Bible scholars for centuries have been agonizing over this one verse. I believe it's one of the most difficult puzzles in Scripture. Let's see what Matthew has to say, or Mark. Mark puts it like this, Mark 9.1. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you that there are some of those who are standing here That's the crowd around Jesus who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. When does that happen? The second coming. The second coming of Jesus, Christ will establish his kingdom with power on this earth and reign for a thousand years, and we will reign with him on this earth. 
So how in the world could Jesus say, hey, some of you that are standing here will not taste death. In fact, you're going to see my kingdom come with power. Folks, I hate to tell you, but that's a false prophecy, and we have to reject. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you guys are freaking out, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness, guys. Matthew adds more. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Okay, this encapsulates the rapture and the second coming. Okay, the, the rapture is the glorious appearing when he comes in his glory with the angels. But when he repays every man is uh, really during the judgment that he pours out on earth. And really that doesn't happen until the final judgment, when he finally does that. Truly I say to you, the next verse, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I pondered this all week. And you know, I used to say, because in Luke chapter 9, verse 28 and forward, uh, which is the passage we're going to cover next week, is the transfiguration. Who, who knows what that is? Okay, that's when Jesus just took a few of the uh, apostles. They went up to a hill, and Jesus was transfigured before them. He began to glow with this great light. And Moses and Elijah showed up and started talking to Jesus. And the three disciples that were with them saw this. And so I used to say, and many Bible scholars say, well, when Christ was transfigured and they saw the power, the glory come on, and he began to glow, and Moses re representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets were there talking to him, they got a glimpse of the kingdom of God and the glory of God. So I used to say, well, you know, it, it, he's just talking about those three apostles that went with them to the mountain and saw this. They got a glimpse of it. They didn't taste death, right? But that's really not what the text says. So I thought about it all week. It agonized me. Luckily, I was paged out a lot this week, so I had a lot of drive time. So uh, even yesterday, I was paged out. Lord, have mercy. The literal interpretation of all these texts, we would have to say, is this. Some of the people Jesus is talking to right then when he was doing that will not taste death until the coming of Jesus in his kingdom, the rapture and the second coming. Okay, this is hard. So then the Holy Spirit said, why don't you just do what you always do and apply the rules of hermeneutics to the text? I always teach, if you apply the rules of hermeneutics to a, a puzzling text, Scripture will always make clear what the text means. Are you with me? So I apply it, hermeneutics to the text. By the way, that's second coming, the end of the seventh week. Will not taste death. It is because of this one passage of Scripture that there are many who do do not believe in the rapture. What are they called? They think Jesus somehow came back in the first century and is now reigning on earth through the church. So that's how they justify this text. They say, oh yeah, they did see Christ coming in his kingdom and he's reigning now through the church. Guess what churches believe that? Catholic. Lutheran, Presbyterian, Anglican. Most of the high churches do not believe in the rapture. In fact, Martin Luther said we should rip the book of Revelation out of our Bibles. Martin Luther. Okay, because they don't believe it. They believe, especially the Catholic Church, they are going to Christianize the world and they will rule from Rome the entire world the Catholic Church. The schools of thought on this are all millennialists. 
there is now, uh, oh, the millennial reign of Christ is now, there's no millennium. Ah means no millennium, the thousand year reign. Uh, Christ is reigning now through the church. <clears throat> Preterist. Most or all of revelation and prophecy has already happened in the first century. You ever heard of that? Okay. Historicists say it's all allegorical and is being fulfilled throughout history. And then what we are is futurist. Most is yet to happen. A Bible prophecy, the end time prophecy. All right. So back to our text. But I say to you truthfully that there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And Matthew says, me come in with the kingdom and power and seeing all of that. So what does it mean? What is Jesus actually saying here? If we take the literal interpretation, we would have to conclude that Jesus had to have come during the first century. Somehow we missed it, but Jesus did come and uh, the people didn't taste death because he came and, and, and we are now the kingdom of God on earth. Okay, that's nonsense. So we can't take this text literally. So then we apply the rules of hermeneutics and it's very simple here. Is it literal or figurative? And the cardinal rule of interpretation is context and let the Bible interpret itself. You've heard this before, most of you. Okay. You interpret scripture with scripture. Okay. It can't be a matter of your own interpretation. So does the Bible elsewhere talk about people not tasting death? Absolutely. And that's how this passage is solved. Jesus clarifies this in the Gospel of John. John 8, 51, truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Do you keep God's word? I do. Hmm. How about John 8, 52? The Jews said to him, <clears throat> now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in, in him shall not perish. Could we say shall not taste death? Same thing, but have eternal life. As believers, we don't die. As believers, we never taste death, none of us. As believers, we simply move from this old tent to our home in heaven. And so what Jesus is saying here is something profound, and he said it at least five times. Keep my word, you won't taste death. Believe in me, you won't taste death. Hey, some of you standing here are going to believe in me and keep my word so you're not going to taste death. Are you with me? Okay. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are of good courage, and I say to prefer rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Are you with me? Okay. So we will never taste death. Back to our text, Luke 9, 27. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. No true believer ever tastes death. Jesus is saying that there are some standing in that crowd, including the apostles, 
that will become true believers and never taste death. Are you with me? So though their body goes to sleep, their soul never dies. They just move. So they never taste death. And they will see Jesus coming in his glory and his kingdom. And so will you and I. I was paged out yesterday for a woman of faith. Oh, she loved the Lord so much. Uh, who was dying. Uh, man, when I would visit her, she would barely respond to anybody, not even her family. But uh, I would just hold her hand and we would sing those old hymns. And she would perk up and start singing the hymns and raising her hands. And, and everybody is just like, whoa, that she's pretty much non-responsive most of the time. And she would just say, I love Jesus. Well, as she was dying yesterday, she was describing heaven. She was transitioning. She wasn't dying. She was just moving. And she's like, I see Jesus, and there's my mom and dad, and there's my uncle. It's the most beautiful. Ah. This has happened so many times on countless deathbeds of Christians, believers, only happens to them. Unbelievers usually, <laughs> no, it's horrible. But there are so many that they don't taste death. They just move, they transition. It was amazing, she saw Christ uh, it was just beautiful. It, 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 it was a beautiful moving day. She didn't taste death. Mm, no, not at all. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those words are a call to radical discipleship. Jesus isn't merely inviting us to admire him. He's not calling us to, well, I put my faith in Jesus. You know, I, I believe in Jesus or be a casual father. He's calling us in a radical way to be disciples. It's a call to surrender, to relinquish the throne of our hearts to him and be transformed into new creations in Jesus Christ. Amen. It's to crucify who we were. Worship team, come on up. This transformation begins with our willingness to die to our old self, to let go of sin and worldly attachments that entangle us. It involves picking up our cross, which signifies a daily decision to follow Christ. Amen? Folks, if we really knew what awaits us in heaven for eternity, if we really knew our inheritance, none of this would matter. Man, none of this would matter at all. It's like, okay, I have to invest 80, 90 years of dying to myself to gain eternity of the most bountiful, amazing, you can't even fathom it. It's so amazing. Jesus calls us to a radical, radical discipleship. So let us not falter in our commitment to follow Jesus. Amen? And let's continually seek his guidance and immerse ourselves in his word and dig deep and press into the Lord. Because only what you do for him matters for eternity. You know, 100 years from now, your house, someone else is going to live in it. Your car will probably be in a junkyard. Or it'll be in a classic museum, depending on what car you have. Yeah. 
your relatives won't remember you. Who's your great great grandpa? I have no idea. Who's my who's my great grandpa? I kind of know a little bit about him, but not much. I don't grieve his loss. I don't know him. My grandpa, I knew well. I grieve his loss. But folks, a hundred years, none of this matters. So let's do great exploits for God. Let's make our lives count. Die to our old flesh and live new in Christ. Amen. Amen. As we do, we will experience the joy of living as new creations in Christ, liberated from the bondage of sin, filled with hope and peace that only comes from that deep relationship with Christ. Amen. Why don't we stand? And sing this song to the Lord. Let's, let's leave it all behind us. Believe and be reborn. Join us in living water. This goes out to every outcast. To the just don't quite fit in. Every wrong way runaway rebel. So ashamed of where you've been. This goes out to every searcher Trying to fill that empty space Well, your searching days are over now Everything's about to change Come on down to the living water Waves of mercy washing over Have you heard about a man named Jesus? He's the way, the truth, and life. Stretched out his arms on a rugged cross, paid ever sinner's price. So when you're tired of all your running, now you don't have to run no more. Now you can leave it all behind you. Now just believe and be reborn. Sweet forgiveness song. Come and join the Jesus people. This is where your heart belongs. Whoa.
you. Well, God bless you. Uh, thanks for the goodies, Debbie and Randy. And uh, there's goodies in the kitchen, so mm -hmm. go grab some. Uh, I pray you have a blessed week. And no, we don't fear death because we're not going to die. You know that? Uh, we do fear pain, though. So, <laughs> Lord, <laughs> let our movement day, day be painless. Uh, God bless you. Have a great week.